praise you, Lord, for your kindness and your mercy to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness to us always, Lord. We are so undeserving, so, so unworthy to be here, Lord God. To sing your praises, even, Lord. Even to acknowledge your goodness. Your, your name does not even belong on our lips when we think of our sin, Lord God. And yet, Lord God, you are so merciful that you invite us in, that you say to us, come and have fellowship with you, Lord God, that we are no longer counted as enemies, but as your friend, as your children. As, Lord God, we come to you today, we want to ask, Lord God, that you would meet with us as you always do, as you so faithfully do, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us, give us, Lord, all that we need uh, to, to hear your word this morning, Lord, to hear from you this morning, Lord. Lord, calm our hearts, still our minds, Lord, take every thought captive to yourself, that all our uh, imagination, all our intelligence, all our everything, Lord, we focus in on you, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we commit our time to you now. And we ask, Lord, for the Sunday school as well as the teachers that are, are busy teaching the children and, and, and pardon to them, Lord, the word of God. We pray, Lord, that you be with them, bless our teachers there, and bless the children, Lord, that they too might hear your word and know that they have heard from you. So, Lord, meet with every one of us, young and old alike, and bless our time to work now. In Jesus' name, amen. You are the church. Uh, is what we are looking at at the moment and what it means. And we've seen how the church is, by definition, a saved group of people. It's not the building. Uh, this, that's why I often refer to this building as the chapel to distinguish uh, from, the, from the idea of this being the church. And I know what we mean. We all know what we mean. We say it's not the church. Uh, but this is the building of the church. It simply belongs to the church. But we technically speak correctly it's correct to say we are saved people, God saved people. When this building is gone, when we are with our Lord in glory, we are still his people. And when these things are possible, and we see how we also have a bride of Christ in Revelation 19, and what a significance that is, and what that means to us as God's people, what it means to be called at the bride of Christ. And I know for some guys it might feel a bit weird to be called a bride. Uh, but it's figurative, it's metaphorical language, and it is helpful for us to see these metaphors uh, and what it means to be called the bride of Christ. It helps us to understand this mysterious thing that we call the church and what the church is. It is a wonderful thing that you're a part of, but it is mysterious and often difficult to understand. This is why these metaphors are given to us in the Bible to understand what this thing is that we are a part of. As the church. And today we have the vine and the branches before us. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 is a, it's a very well known portion of scripture. Uh, we in our Bible study on the Wednesday nights have been looking at 1 John, and very often we come back to this. Almost every week we come back to this uh, in John chapter 15 because it is key to really understanding the whole book of John. Uh, it, is, it is central to, to John's message. And it is so important that we understand it. Jesus is saying and talking to his disciples, and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be 
my disciples. Those are what God's word to us this morning. There's too much there for us to unpack everything. So I want to give you the key to unpack this passage for yourself. If you can, for yourself, understand what this uh, passage is about. I once met a farmer. We went away for a weekend. And, um, and uh, we love our church so much. We don't enjoy going away. But in order for us to continue to love you, uh, we find ourselves sometimes needing to have to go away. Uh, and I think you know what I mean. We need a break sometimes from the, from the routine. And we went away to the Nay Valley, which is between Robertson and, and Worcester. It is a very fruitful valley. Uh, it is a, a rich valley, a farming area. And, uh, and I was talking to the farmer who was a citrus farmer. He was staying on this farm and he had fruit, he had vegetables, uh, you name it. It was just, there's was plenty of water there. And uh, there was a variety of these healthy crops and fertile ground. Uh, and you could see this farmer loved his farm. Uh, he, and he loved farming. Every five minutes he'd get on his quad bike and off he would go again. I think he was hyperactive or something, he just couldn't sit still. But he would be on his motorbike and off he would go into the fields and back again. This went on the whole time, the whole day. He never seemed to stop. First thing in the morning, the sun is already set at night and he's still up and down on his motorbike. So he joked and said, he's watching his, watching his uh, sponge bag growing, you know. Um, uh, we don't know what he was doing, but he was out tweaking things in the field, checking the sprinklers, doing who knows what, uh, just watching his things grow. And uh, I asked him on one occasion when he came back, and uh, and I said to him, have you always been a farmer? And he said to me, no, actually, I, I haven't. I was in corporate. I was in the corporate world, and uh, I retired from that. And with my retirement, I was a financial director at Sassel. That's what you get when you retirement, you go and buy a fruit farm and uh, working for SAS at that level. And uh, he said I was a financial director and I took my retirement and I bought this fruit farm. So I said, well, how did you know how to farm? Have you been in the family or what? And the answer was, no, not at all. This is just me doing this now. I run it as a business. But I don't run it alone, he said to me. I have consultants, I have workers, I have foremen who tell me what to do. Guys will come and will tell me what chemicals to use for, for what pests. They'll go and inspect the fields and come and say, we need this and we need that for this disease or that pest. Uh, what fertilizers to put into the soil. And all of that technical information is all given to him by experts that he relies on. And, uh, and you can tell, and he would be told when and what to plant by those in the know and what to harvest, what to prune and what to cut back. Uh, and he just simply had to follow the rules. And obviously, being a financial guy, he knew how to follow the rules. You know, that's what financial people should do, should I say. Uh, <laughs> but the foreman, on the other hand, had experience. The workers do the work. And so there's a whole team of people that run that farm and seem to be run it very successfully. When you understand the laws of nature of God uh, that have been set in place, all we have to do is follow the rules. Do and abide by those rules, and he takes care of the rest to bring about his purpose. It is the same in life, and it is the same in church as we see it in farming and growing things. Now, not many of us, I recognize this morning, are experienced as farmers or in farming, and so this, this imagery that comes to us needs some explanation. I'm sorry that uh, to say that foraging in the fruit and veg section at, at the supermarket does not qualify you as a farmer. This doesn't count, does it? It's not the same. But in ancient biblical times, people knew the land. They lived close to the land, so to speak. They understood farming. They understood uh, how important farming was. They understood uh, the necessity of it to, to succeed. And like our sophisticated uh, markets today and systems that we have, you ate and you drank what you grew, what grew near the town. And, uh, and, and, and your lives were shaped by the crops and the harvest seasons, by rainfall, by pests, by disease, by floods, droughts. All those things had a direct impact on you immediately. It was a very real uh, a thing for people to understand. It was so important because you knew that's where your next meal comes from. Not from the supermarket, but from the fields. And it was so important to them. Even now, I know that with all our sophisticated systems, don't try and buy yourself potato chips. And there's a, there's a national shortage because of all the rain that we had that has impacted on the farms and because of the floods and, 
and those areas that palace can't get too much water, and so there's a massive shortage in our country of potatoes at the moment. And so even we, in our sophisticated times, uh, feel the effects. So much more made in days gone by, 2,000 years ago, how much more important farming and understanding farming was. We were so dependent on good farming. And the imagery that Jesus uses here, so it would have fell on ears initially that understood what he means. Uh, it would just be obvious to what he was saying and would be uh, so significant. It would have spoken volumes to the listeners. I hope it speaks volumes to us. We, we may need a little bit of extra help from the Holy Spirit to understand it. But as I said, as I promised you, I'm going to give you three keys. The first key is, we find in verse 1, the first part of verse 1, I am the true vine, Jesus says. And you need to understand what Jesus is saying when he says, I am the true vine. First of all, I want you to do yourself a favor. You know, I always like to give you over. And do yourself a favor and go and do some a study for yourself. You don't benefit. You'll be greatly blessed by it. On all the I am statements of Jesus in the Bible, there's many of them. And this is just one of them, the great I am statements uh, that, that we find in the, in the Gospels. Jesus is declaring something by saying, I am. He is it's actually he is speaking with divine authority. He is claiming divine authority. I am. Remember, God said, who shall I say? And he said, tell them, I am the sending you, you're speaking here. And there's I am. And so Jesus is actually claiming a divine title here. He's actually telling us, I am the Lord, I am God. So it is, it is already from the very get-go here, we see that Jesus is making a very bold statement of being God himself who is actually speaking. We know that, okay? We remember, we're looking backwards, we're looking in hindsight. Uh, Jesus is speaking to first-time listeners. This is a very bold statement that he is making, carrying the vine authority. And he says, I am the true vine. Which, of course, implies that there is such a thing as a false one. That's just human reason, isn't it? That's exactly what he's saying. I am the true vine, differentiating from other vines that there might be. Now, what or who could a false vine be? Some suggest it's the nation of Israel. If you read Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, uh, you could come to this conclusion quite easily. In verse 7 it says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. The garden of his, that's God's delight. That's in Isaiah 5, verse 7. He speaks and he relates Israel to being this vineyard. And then she tells us here, I'm telling you, the vineyard is Israel. Okay, so it's easy to come to that conclusion. Israel, Israel though, in that Isaiah chapter 5, is chapter 5, is described as yielding only bad fruit. And so, despite all of the Lord's care, and this is, the, this is what the Lord is saying to Israel in Isaiah chapter 5, despite all the care, all the attention, all the protection, the hedge of everything around you, despite all of that, all of my care and provision, you are yielding bad fruit. I mean, the word true there means, in, in back, to, so back to John chapter 15, the word true means genuine. It means uh, trustworthy, as opposed to what's false, or what's counterfeit, what's not true, or what's not real. It's just not real. You know, you get SMSs or, or WhatsApp messages, and the guy claiming something is going to happen this year, World War Three, whatever it is. You pause for a moment and say, is this real before you get sent on to all your friends? Okay, please. <laughs> That's all the paper, okay? If you probably fake, it's probably false, especially if it says you can share this with everyone. And you know, that's the giveaway, okay? That's for free this morning, I'll give that to you. But uh, there is so much fake and false and counterfeit that is out there. That's not true. That we don't know to be real. It could be, but we just don't know, do we? There's so many claims that are made. And Jesus, when he says, I am true, it's real. He I the genuine thing here. And I, I, I hope that, that you can see that this morning. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5, he says, You turned to God from idols. He's talking to the church here. And he Paul is in Thessalonians. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 
those two false gods from the idols and all the other gods that are no gods at all. You turn from that, he told the Thessalonians. It's very much a pagan society. You turn from that to the true God. And that's Jesus, is what he is saying here. And he also just, by saying, I am true, Jesus is distinguishing from what is man made, what is something that man has created as opposed to what God has created. The idea of the Spirit. Uh, 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 the idea that the Spirit of God has done something here as opposed to what, the, what is true and as opposed to what is flesh and what is false and what is wrong. Where Israel had failed to remain faithful, had failed to, to remain true to God and to worship God, to serve Him properly, God now has done through His Son. This is Jesus saying, I am going to do what they have failed to do. And of course, in that is so much, it's just loaded with messianic language that I am the one, I am the Messiah, I am the true one who's come to save and to do what the people of God could not do. Jesus doesn't say that I am the vineyard. I, he says, I am the true vine. And so he makes this differentiation between the two, between the nation of Israel and between himself between failure and between success, between what man is unable to do and what God has done in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus produced what Israel failed to do, the good fruits Jesus brought about, what no person could do. And think about it, they were given, in a sense, the best of circumstances, the perfect environment, it's like an incubator. Uh, and in that environment where they were cared for, provided, they had the patriarchs, they had the law, they, they had the miracles of, of, of them being brought out of, the, out of, out of, out of Egypt and, the, and the, the establishment of the nation and all the miracles that took place, the, in the battles won, the Jerichos and all of those things, they had all those things. They were brought into a land of, of milk and honey and milk and money. It was, uh, it was everything that you could wish for. The fruit was, was beautiful. If you've ever been to Israel, you go to the markets, it's like, where do they get this fruit from? It's like, we get the leftovers here. The good stuff, it's, it's grown there. It's, 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 in, it's in, a, in a fertile region. They were given all of that in the best, and best of circumstances, and yet they still failed. Think of it in terms of yourself, as you continue to then. Think of it in terms of your own striving, in terms of your own efforts, in terms of your, your own trying to get it right, trying to overcome, trying to throw off that, that, that sin that's dogging you, trying to be a better person. Your own striving to try and, and, and get through life, you're trying to save yourself. How we fail? How did that work out for you? How is that working out for you? I can tell you it's not. Because you are not Jesus. You're not the true vine. You're not the one. Only the Lord can say. And only the Lord can do in us what God can do. There are things that we cannot do. We are limited as, as human beings. Israel taught us that, showed us that. So stop your trying. Stop trying in your own efforts. Because the Lord has done what's needed to be done in order to save us. You are not the true one, as Israel was not. Therefore, you cannot save yourself. Only God can save you. Again, I say that Israel, with all that was invested into them, and having received the Old Testament law, and all the special treatment, if they failed to succeed in doing what God had told them to do, how can you expect that you can somehow do better than they could do, than what they are capable of? They were not the true vine. They were not even the vine, and neither are you. Jesus is the true vine, the perfect vine, doing what man had failed to do. And the perfect replaces the imperfect. And when Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God, he fulfilled the Old Testament promises. And all the hope of the Messiah. That's your first key to see Jesus as the true Son of God, the Messiah, the true one. Your second key is my father is the God in the on verse one, then you believe it. And we are all after me. But uh, 
Can you believe it? We're only on verse 2nd part. But I have to give you these keys and the rest can fall back into place. My father is the God that he says. God is the father in this passage and has taken the, the initiative by sending his son to live the perfect life and to die the perfect death so that you can be saved from your sin. And he continues, as we see here, to do his work. He cuts and he prunes. This is what the father does. He is the farmer, the gardener, the, the, the one who grows the vine. The vines, as we know, and I, I feel I need to explain this, the vines are the main part of the branch. It's the stump, as we well. Notice just when you walk through our vineyards here, and there's a certain time of year where they'll cut back all the branches and you just think with the stump sticking out the ground. You just say, how's this thing ever going to grow again? But it does, doesn't it? A big, normally a big, big <laughs> chunky stump that's, that's left in the ground that's connected to the root. From there grows the branches. From there comes the shoots and all the fruit that grows as a result. And so God is the farmer who cuts and prunes. Whereas the vine, the true vine, is the main branch the stump that is established, and from it grows the branches uh, and in season and, and, and out of season, various things happen. But they must be pruned back at a certain time of the year, or they won't grow. If you ask the farmer, you'll tell them, I'll tell you this is true. If they don't cut those millions back, they won't produce the, the grapes that they can produce. And if they do, they won't produce good grapes. This is why it's a necessary part of the process in order to see the grapes laden certain time of the year. In order for there to be new life on the vine, they have to prune it back. And if you're a horticulturalist, you know this, you can, you can, uh, uh, you can ask somebody who is a horticulturist, when that vine is cut, when it's happening, chemicals are released. Now, I'm not going to go into all the biology of it, but chemicals are released and they're cut that cause the new shoots and the leaves to grow. That's so why when you cut back a bush, it bounces back all of a sudden in a few days because chemicals are released and they, 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 they cause the leaves and good, healthy fruit to grow. There's two different actions that are described here by Jesus of what the Father does. The two different actions is, first of all, we're told that he cuts off. One of the things that the Lord does, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Uh, Romans 11 describes a remnant of Israel who are chosen and saved by grace uh, and not by works in verses 5 to 8 of Romans 11. But others, it says, were hardened and therefore were judged. And some of the branches have been broken off and therefore salvation has come to the Gentiles who have been grafted into the promises of God, who have been brought into the blessings of Israel to receive what God had promised. This is a very decisive action, isn't it? It's a, it sounds almost quite drastic, and it is. When you're watching a, a gardener or a, or a farmer, this is very decisive. Yeah, there's a decisive action of judgment. You're cutting back a weed of sorts. You just hack, well, at least I do. Peter helps, and the two of us go over this thing. And there's no care taken. It's just chopping, and it's cutting. You don't care if this thing bounces back or not. You cut it right back. You cut off all the dead foliage because it's not doing anything. It's a very decisive action of judgment that is reserved for the enemies of God. It is very deliberate action. And it is speaking to those who deliberately keep on sinning that this is what will take place. Those who reject His Son, Jesus Christ, once falling under it, there is no hope of fruit after that. There's no hope for those branches anymore, but only, as we're told, a fearful expectation of the raging fire of hell. And read Hebrews chapter 10 for a full description of that. Only that's all that's there. Once we've rejected God's Son, once we've rejected His offer of salvation, this is the consequence, His judgment in Hebrews 10. The second action that we see here, of what the Father does, He says that every branch that does bear fruit he prunes. Very different description, so that it will be even more fruitful. The Greek word for, for prunes here also means he cleans. He cuts back, he's cleaning back, he's cleaning up uh, the, the bush. Have you ever watched somebody work on a farm side? They've got 
It looks like nail clippers and all these very delicate little instruments. They took off little things here and there to make that bonsai look as, as ingrained as it does. The, here we see that the Lord loves his vineyard. He loves God. He, he loves his own and he defends his glory with discipline. Now as unpleasant as discipline feels to us as God's people, as being even being pruned sounds painful. Uh, as painful as it is, we know that it is needed for our growth and maturity. If you have no hardship in your life, you will not grow. It's just what it is. It's a law of nature. The, this, this pruning is necessary for our maturity and for our growth. A little bit later on in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, to us, he's talking to God's people, endure hardship as discipline, he says. God is treating you as his sons. Uh, God disciplines us for our own good, it says, that we may share in his holiness. And then he acknowledges in verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We, we will come back to this idea of being, of being pruned. But this is what the Lord does. Those who he loves, he disciplines as a child. The third key in this whole passage is the branches. Verses 3 to 5, the first part of God. Jesus is speaking to believers again. He says that um, you are already clean. I am saying that he's saying you are you've already been cleansed, you've already been saved, you've already been sanctified through 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 the word of God. So you're already clean. And so he's speaking clearly to believers here by saying that because of the word I have spoken to you, because they believed in that word by faith, says you're already clean because of the gospel message that saves, that they have believed by faith. Now we know that the church is made up of many individual branches, believers who, with Christ as the head of the vine, that constitutes the church. The vine establishes the branches. From the vine, the branches grow. Because without the vine, there are no branches. There can't be branches. It doesn't, it doesn't go straight from the root to the branch. It goes root to the, to the, to the vine and then to the branches. It is, it is the vine that feeds and sustains the branches. We are the branches. As, as the vine draws up water and the nutrients out from the soil, it feeds the branches and grows the branches. But it is, the vine is the plant's foundational strength and, the, and it protects the weak branches. That's where the branch's stability is. That's where its strength lies. When the wind blows or when there's, there's, there's harsh weather, it's the strength of the vine that holds onto those branches. It's, it's, it, it, it makes those branches secure. So you can see why this idea of the Lord being our vine and we being the branches is so powerful and so effective in understanding how we need the Lord, how we can't do it without Him. He is supporting us, we're not supporting Him. He is feeding us. He is the one that nurtures us and establishes us. And therefore the idea of the branch being independent from the vine is so absurd. You can't be a good person you can't be a Christian, you can't be whatever, a better Christian without the Lord's activity in your life. It's not something that can be done on your own. You cannot live independent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And likewise, the work of the Father and the Son together are essential. Now expert farmers and, and gardeners know that for plants and gardens to be healthy and to produce fruits, it needs to be cut back and pruned, or it just gets overgrown, and it uses up the plant uses up those dead branches use up wiping nutrients. But when cut back, when it, when, it, when they cut back those branches, it creates a space for more food for what's left behind for the good part of the plants uh, to grow. And those growth chemicals that I spoke about are released, and the same is is amount of water that was available to the whole plant is now available to a smaller part of that plant, fruit-bearing branches, to produce even more and better fruits. When you see the gardener at work though, 
we had a friend who was a horticulturist, he came to our garden and on the stage, just went crazy. <laughs> I wanted to hold it back and say, what are you doing? You're like, I need to be growing something. She just plucked and plucked and there was this mound of stuff that she had just cut away. And when she was busy, it was really hard to appreciate what she was doing. It was, it was quite difficult to actually watch what was going on there because years of growth, I mean years, that's how bad the garden I am. Years of growth had taken place there without any pruning or any cutting back. And she just came in and cleaned up and cleared up. And our garden was a much better, happier place after that experience. But at the time, when you see the garden at work, the two separate actions of cutting or breaking off and the, the pruning, they look very similar. In fact, the two actions can even be confused because they look so similar. But the outcomes are very different. Some of the plants she cut right down to the stump right at the bottom because she didn't want them to grow anymore. Others she carefully shaped and pruned back because she knew what she was trying to achieve. The outcome is very different. When you think of the two actions of our father, the outcomes are very different. When we go through hardship, it could be mistaken that God is somehow judging me, that God is somehow punishing me. That maybe I'm not even saying, maybe God is against me now that I'm suffering like this and going through these hardships. It can be so easily mistaken as God's judgment on us, whereas it's God's discipline for us, not against us. Remember how Job, and if you've read Job, you know the story, how he lost everything and he went through sickness and, and poverty and everything. He lost everything, he lost his family and you name it, he lost it. Everything that he, he, he had in this world, he, he lost it. And Job had to wrestle with this, this, this sense of suffering in the sovereignty of God. That God is, is in control and he, kept, he keeps coming back to this, despite the terrible counsel of his well-meaning, I don't know if I were that well-meaning friends, their self-righteous friends who are coming giving him such bad advice, accusing him of all sorts of things, he keeps coming back to this. I know, I know that. The wicked stuff. I know that these things happen, but God is sovereign. God, this is God's hand here. He's pruning me. He's not casting me aside. He's not cutting me off. The good branches, the gardener takes care in pruning. That's what you call acceptance. You must use a good, sharp pair of pruning shears. Don't use the old broken pair. It damages the plant when you cut it. It crushes the branches. So you use a very sharp pruning shears. The, 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 the farmer is pruning, use those sharp shears because the point is not to damage, but to cut away. She cut in very critical places, near certain nodes, and she knew exactly where to cut in order to stimulate new shoots from those nodes. And as she shaped and as she cut the dead and the dying branches, the disease that parts away. And as a result, the tree is better for it. The vine is better for it once the gardener has pruned it. Initially, it's a shock. Initially, everything is barren and sparse and stripped away. You wonder if the plant's ever going to recover. Is your plant ever going to recover? And you wonder if it will. But within a very short space of time, within days, there are new shoots already. There are green new shoots coming out, and there is new life that begins to form. New, healthy, fresh shoots and flowers and fruit that comes as a result as the cutting stimulates those growth hormones. More light was left in that encouraged, of course, new life. It is all a healthy process. Such is the way of the Lord as he deals with us, his people. It is good. God is always good. Even in our sufferings, God remains good. God is always faithful and always kind and always merciful and gracious to us. And if you're going through a pruning right now, Thank the Lord, but thank you, Lord, that I've encountered worthy to suffer, that you've considered me worthy to be pruned, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, that I can suffer like you do as we are pruned. It is gracious and it is purposeful when the Lord prunes us. Where is what is cut off? It's a very different picture. What is unhealthy and doesn't bear fruit, and that produce those, those, those non-fruit producing branches are cut down. They're thrown away and they burnt up. They worst off. They are worse off than before. This is why we must not envy the wicked. Though they might succeed for a time and for a season, 
Then they will come, but God will cut them down, throw them away, and it will be burnt up. It is a metaphorical picture of Jesus as the vine that we have before us. The Father is the gardener, and we, the church, is branches. It gives us really such a good uh, idea of the nature and manner that God deals with us as people. The way that God works in us and the way that God works through us. We are cleansed and we are saved to produce good fruit. Of fruit of righteousness and holiness and service to God. And so the only thing that's left now is to bring it all together, isn't it? We've got the keys. The, the application to us now is to remain, to abide in Christ. Stick with it. Stay with it. Abide in Him. Abide in Christ. So what is this abiding in the Bible? Verses 4, right through to verse 7, we see this abiding in the Bible. In fact, the whole book of John, you can see this abiding picture. Uh, and this thread of abiding runs throughout the passage and throughout the book, uh, weaving its way, weaving and bringing it all together. To remain, to abide, means to stay, to stick with something, stick with it. In, in your studies, you know what it's like? When those exams are on, you're like, you just, I just don't want it. I don't really need that mark. And so there's that temptation that comes on you when you're tired, when it's difficult, and you're like, ah, it's just not worth staying up another hour and just studying that section. I just hope the teacher's not going to do it. <laughs> but, and uh, as a gamble, don't do it. Uh, you can sleep later on, you can sleep when you get but when you study, you stay <laughs> hanging there, okay? Just, just hanging there, because that's the temptation that comes on you. And when times are tough, you might want to throw it in. Well, this being a Christian thing is just too difficult. I'm, I'm just going to give it up. I just want to go back to my old lifestyle. It just felt easier to not be a Christian. Don't be fooled by that. It's a temptation. This abiding means to stay or to reside, to keep on, to continue with, and to live in Christ Jesus. This illustration of a vine that is used is used so that everyone, from the youngest to the oldest, can understand that the Lord He will break off branches that are not abiding in Him. And it, it is, we are told in this passage, we are commanded to abide. We are incentivized to abide. The implications that the abide or we don't are given to us. And there is reasoning here with us to abide. Because apart from him, you can do no good thing. But in him, you can produce much fruit. Not just a little, much fruit. There's a picture of abundance. Why is it so important that we abide? He gives us a whole lot of things here. First of all, so that we can remain in Christ Jesus. Be in his presence. That we can remain in him. If he says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. Second of all, so that you can bear much fruit is a result of abiding. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. There you will bear much fruit. Again, not little, but lots of fruit if you remain in him. The third reason why we must abide is because of judgment. We have the carrot and we have the stick, don't we? This is the stick part of it. Uh, we can incentivize and we can bear much fruit and that the Lord will remain in. But the implication is if you don't abide, there is judgment. You don't bear fruit. Proves that, that you are, 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 are not saved and therefore, if, it, if you do not, if you are, are, are not bearing fruit, it proves that, that there is that possibility that you are not saved and therefore, you face the prospect of being cut, and cut off and thrown away when you will wither and be ultimately in danger of fires of hell. It is a very graphic, detailed picture of the fate of the unsaved. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you are unsaved. Or maybe you're not abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the only thing that is left for you. It could be today, it could be now, it could be tomorrow when this will come about, but it will come about if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved and to be cleansed. The fourth thing of why we must abide is because of divine favor and blessing. Then we come to the carriage, the incentive. 
that you can ask whatever you wish and it will be given, he said. But he, this is communion, this is fellowship, that you can speak to the Lord and that he hears you. But how do you abide in Christ? I want you to leave here today without understanding. We as believers abide by obedience to God's word, by doing what it says, by following the rules, by doing what God has said, so that his word may remain in you and that you can have fellowship with God. It's only by being in him that we can be like him in his image, that we are able to actually remain in him and do his will in our lives. So it begins when we put our faith and trust in Jesus to be saved, and it continues an ongoing process. This will produce much good fruit, fruit of righteousness and service that the Lord requires and that the Lord is pleased with. If you see what you must do in the Word of God, and if you know what you must do, and you do not do it, you have to stop and ask yourself, am I really in Jesus? Is the person who comes here on a Sunday morning very different to the person outside there in the so-called real world? Are there two different people? If you're living a double life, ask yourself, am I really saved? Am I really abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you see that what you must do in the Word and you don't do it, that's a red flag. That's a warning light going off. There's no real good fruit, but only bad fruit. Test yourself against Galatians chapter 5 if you're not sure. Go and read about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. If you don't see the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you've got to ask yourself, is the fruit of the Spirit in my life? That's just obvious, isn't it? It's just perfect reasoning, uh, perfectly good reasoning. It is possible, we read here, to be clean and saved and not abiding. Why would Jesus say to him, you must abide in me? He's told him, you're clean, you're saved. And yet, there is a possibility, otherwise he wouldn't have said it, for us not to abide in him. He tells us we must abide, which suggests that it's possible for a believer to walk away from the Lord, to be in rebellion for a time, to doubt, to, to, to forsake the promises of God for a season. Not forever, but for a season. When you go through this, where it is possible for a believer even to, to allow sin to reside in their lives that you know about, but you better be very careful. If you what you see there is not, uh, what you see in a passage like Galatians chapter 5 is not what you see in your life, you need to return. God is graciously calling you back to Himself uh, to submit to His Word, confess His sins, repent of it, and He will cleanse you that you will not have to face the consequences for your sin. Those who show no fruit of salvation, we are told, will be cut off. God will not be mocked. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, John the Baptist, speaking to the religious leaders and the people, the elite, of, of Israel is there. And he said, he called them the fruit of fighters, and he was totally not friendly, was he? Definitely not super sensitive at all. But uh, he just lambasted him, and he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The true vine is the source of everything for the branches. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. You will not come right alone, my friend. It's not even trying. I can save you a lot of time and effort. You cannot come right by yourself. You will not find the peace you're looking for. You will not find the forgiveness you're looking for. You will not find the wholeness and the contentment that you're looking for. You will not find the joy that you want. You will not have the hope unless you are abiding in Jesus Christ. The vine is the source of life for the branches. You are the branches. If you are disconnected, there is no life. No evidence of the fruit of salvation. And this, if there is, will bring our Father glory and you will be kept in Him and you will bear much fruit. Praise God for His words. That's the spot. I hope the challenge to you as it is to all of us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for your blessing upon us, dear God. Thank you that we are your children, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when we are weak and when we wonder, when we stray. 
Oh, have mercy on us, Lord God. We thank you that in your grace and your mercy you call us out of that and back to yourself. Oh, Lord, I pray for anyone here today who does not know you, who has never put their faith and trust in you to be saved. Lord, and has, perhaps today has recognized a terrifying prospect for them, that if they do not make right with you, and do not put their faith and trust in you, Lord, there's nothing left for them but to be cut off and to be thrown in the fire. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would, would awaken their souls to you, Lord God, that they can put their faith and trust in you today to be saved. Thank you for your word to each of us, Lord. May we produce abundant fruit as we abide in you, Lord God, as we remain in you through thick and thin, through good times and bad, Lord God, through the most difficult and the darkest of nights. May, Lord, we never lose sight of you as we remain in you. Thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Lord God, for your work in us, Lord. And we praise you for that, Lord. And commit ourselves to you now in the process of Jesus' name. Amen. In June 24 and 25, it says, To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all generations, now and forevermore, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you.